Evening. Oh, I am. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Allegheny Arts Council. Um, I'm Julie Westendorf. I'm the director here. Um, it's so good to see all of you tonight. Thanks for coming to support um, the artists and the queens involved. Um, tonight is really special for us because this is now our second time getting to work with the exhibiting artists I'm going to have the honor to introduce shortly. Um, you, some of you might remember a couple of years ago we did a program with him called Mountain Traditions that focused on tradition bearers in Appalachia. It was an amazing program and we had such a great experience that when he called us again and he told us this program, we felt so strongly that this work was important and impactful that we decided to help fund this exhibition. So I'm really pleased tonight to finally see it come to fruition. I also want to say a very special thanks to all of the queens who've participated in the exhibition. Um, I know that it is a, a, a vulnerable thing to share yourself. Mike and I have talked a lot about the trust that has to happen to, to show yourself so authentically um, and congratulate you. It's a beautiful exhibit and we're so thrilled to have you guys here tonight. So I will now introduce uh, our featured guest for tonight. Uh, Michael O. Snyder is a documentary photographer and filmmaker exploring the dynamic relationship between environmental and cultural change. An environmental and climate scientist by training, Mike uses his combined knowledge of visual storytelling and conservation to create narratives that drive social impact. His photojournalism work has been featured in all kinds of amazing places like National Geographic, The Guardian, and The Washington Post, and exhibited at galleries around the world. He is a Portrait of Humanity Award winner, a Pulitzer grantee, a Climate Journal Journalism Fellow at the Bertha Foundation, and tonight he is on his way to his next gig, which is on the faculty at Syracuse University. So we are so proud to have him as a native son to our community and a friend to the gallery, Mike Snyder. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks so much for having me tonight, and thanks for being out here. It's, it's really lovely to see everyone. So again, I'm Mike Snyder. I'm originally from Frostburg, Maryland. This is the Queens of Queen City. I'm really excited to be sharing it with you after almost more than 10 years, really, of working on this project. Uh, I'm going to be pretty brief so we can spend more time on the panel, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the origin story of this project, how it got started. I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you about some of the photos and kind of what I wanted to do, what I really wanted to poke at and explore with this project. But really importantly, before doing that, I've got a few shout outs and thank yous that are really important uh, to me to do. So first, I want to give a really big recognition for the Pulitzer Center, um, who supported not only the creation of this project. Um, without those kind of partners, it's really hard to do this long-term kind of work. But I think for me, even more importantly, went above and beyond to support the programming tonight. So they are supporting this, help with the prints, and help with getting folks here on the stage to talk with you guys, present back to you. And that kind of impact, that that focus on generating community dialogues and engagement, that's why I do what I do. So I get really excited when a, a funding body um, is eager and excited to support that, that part of journalism as well. So I'm really excited for this part of the project and to have them on board. So Pulitzer Center, a Virginia Quarterly Review. I met before I ran up here to grab the magazine, um, to, to wave it in front of you so you can see it. I don't have it, maybe someone will grab it and I'll show it to you. But the first run of this story was published in Virginia Quarterly Review. Um, which is a wonderful magazine based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, and they did 50 images for the project and like an 8,000, 10,000 word um, essay from Ray Geringer of Country Queers, also supported by Pulitzer. And it's an incredible story that really dives in principally to the words and the stories of the folks in this project. Uh, and I've been working with them for about six years to get that out the door as well. And it's also really hard to find partners in this space that want to do long form journalism. So it's a really, really great piece. If Around tonight, when you walk around the gallery, there are QR codes. And if you scan them, you can read the piece online. And there's also one to buy the magazine. And I suggest if you want to dive deeper, hear more of these stories, and really feel the meat of this project, that's the way to do it. So Virginia Quarterly Review, a next Allegheny Arts Council, and Julie, who I think has just ran off, I was going to embarrass her, have just been amazing partners to work with. We're really blessed in this community to have a gallery space like this. I'm in an organization that wants to support and bring these kind of projects here. So really, really essential partners. I'm excited to be back here again tonight. Uh, almost there. Digital Silver Imaging did the prints on the walls. A quick shout out to them. They are a world-class studio based in Boston. I got to know them because they printed some of my work at Nat Geo. 
And they came to me and they said, if you do work that's on historically marginalized communities or climate change, we will discount that significantly for you so you can get it back to those communities. And they have been an amazing, amazing partner to work with. These are gorgeous, world-class, museum-quality prints that they do. I've seen other prints of this work, and these blow them out of the water. So a huge shout out to them. And finally, and then I'll be done with my thank yous and recognitions, but by far most importantly, and I'm going to embarrass some folks here, I want the drag queens that are part of this uh, project to please stand. I'm going to get out of the way so you can see them to be recognized. Please stand up. You're on stage all the time. You can be on stage tonight. <laughs> These are just um, a small number of a group of maybe about 12 folks. Um, and I just want to, don't sit down yet because i got a th few things to say now. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying thank you so much for giving me so much of your time. You know how much time you've given me. It's an awful lot. You've been incredibly patient with cameras in your faces for years and patient with me as I got to know you and understand your world better. And I can't thank you enough for your trust, right? You've been amazing to work with. And thank you for sharing your stories with me and with this, this community. I know I've said this to you individually before, but I want to embarrass you by saying it here. I think you're all incredibly beautiful inside and out. I think you are a treasure here, and you make this place a better place. And we all owe you a debt of gratitude for that. And I'm also very grateful to call you my friends. So thank you guys so very much. You are the real heroes of this project. It's about you, but it's also for you. So enjoy it. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And you can be seated. <laughs> Okie doke. That was the hard part. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to tell you uh, a little bit um, about this project. Again, how it got started. I'll get my clicker and some of the photos. And then we've got a little bit of time. If you have some questions for me, I want to, if you have questions for me specifically about the making of this project, I'm happy to address that. But the bigger issues about what it means to be a drag queen, what it means to be queer in Appalachia just now, I really want to um, defer to our panel on that. So I'll tell you a bit about the photos in the story. OK, so quickly, um, can people see that well enough? Yeah, let me dim a little bit more. Yeah, great. So I, as I said, I'm from, from Frostburg. And it was about, yeah, can we have one more pull down maybe? People can see one more. We're almost there. Yeah, that may be, might be about as good as we get. Anyway, these are on the wall. So you can see them later if you can't see them now. So as I said, I'm from Frostburg. And about 12 years ago, it was in 2011, my sister and I were both home visiting. And we were uh, one evening in desperate need of entertainment. And so we opened up the Cumberland Times newspaper looking for anything to do. And we saw, and I swear it was in all bold letters, it said, drag show tonight. And we, growing up here, we had never seen anything like this before. That isn't to say it hadn't existed, but, but we certainly hadn't seen it. So minutes later, we were here in the Embassy Theater, right here on Baltimore Street with our, our Budweiser in one hand and our tickets in the other hand, uh, eager to see what we figured was probably either a misprint, that was the most likely outcome, or what was probably going to be the cultural event of the century. And you've, you've, you've got to understand, it isn't that we were surprised necessarily that there are queer folks in, in the region. Like, there isn't some sort of force field that keeps the rainbow flags at bay outside of Appalachia or magically transforms people's gender identities in the region, right? Folks are here. It's just that this is a region that is self-professed hillbilly country, right? And it's got its gifts and its graces for sure, but it's not maybe best known for being tolerant towards sexual nonconformity, right? So we were both impressed and surprised and delighted to see that some of our small town neighbors uh, would deign to be so outrageously, so fabulously queer in public and on stage, right? That was surprising. That was really cool. And we were going to be there. So we went. So I went to the show. There's actually a few folks that were in that show th then that are here now. I want to recognize them. Um, we've got Maxine Young in the back was there that night. We've known each other for over a decade. You were there the night, Christian Diane, I believe. Maybe not. Maybe were you there? She doesn't know. I don't, you know. We were both drinking. I had a lot of Budweiser. <laughs> uh, there's a few others that, that were there that night. Um, not you and not you yet. But there were a few that were there that night. And what I saw that night, both the courage and the charisma of the performers on the stage, that was amazing. They were pouring themselves out. <laughs> it was the drag in this region has gotten better since that time. It wasn't the best drag that night. Hello, darlings. Come on in. Sit down. Good to see you. Um, but they were pouring themselves out. And second, the diversity and the complexity of the crowd. Right? So both of those things challenged what I thought I knew about this region and put me on this journey to better understand this source of uncensored authenticity that I saw that night. I was really inspired and really interested in doing this project. So in 2011, I started going to more drag shows. 
I started talking to people. And it was really important to me. I took my time with this project, right? I may be from this region, but it's not a community I'm part of. So building that trust, building those relationships, putting relationships first, which I think is what it means to do documentary work anyway. Uh, that should be the outcome, is relationships, network building, engagement. But I wanted to put that time in. It's 2017, I started taking photos. 2019, we finally got the grant to do this. And in 2021 is when Ray Geringer, the writer, came on board to work on this. So this project has a long, uh, long front end and a, hopefully a long back end to it, too. So I'll show you some photos now, talk a little bit more about some of the things that I really wanted to explore. So first, courage. Right? It seems to me to do this in a region where identities like this are not always appreciated or understood or even accepted. Right? Where do you find that source of, court, that, that source of courage? Right? And so we, we talked about this a lot in the interviews that we did over the years. And I want to give you some examples. One is from family. You, know, you may have a family member, maybe a, a mother or a grandmother or a cousin or somebody that gets you and understands you and shows up for you. That can be a powerful source of courage. Maybe you've got a really great friend or a drag sister that shows up for you. Maybe you don't have a great show and they say, hey, you know what? You got this. You can do it next time. That's who shows up for you. Maybe you've got a partner that's there for you and helps you explore this, helps you feel strong enough to be able to do this even when times are up or times are down. Or maybe you're just a badass bitch, and on the inside, you don't give a shit what people think about you. <laughs> and all of them have this to a certain extent, by the way. And the source of courage just comes from within. Even if the world outside says, we, you know, we don't want you, we hate you, screw you, whatever. You're like, no, this is me, this is who I am, and I'm going to be unabashedly authentic about that, and you're going to have to deal with it, right? And a lot of the folks here, and I, I think these two images, so many more really capture uh, that part of the personality of so many of these queens. Another thing I want to look at is repercussions. You know, what happens whenever somebody does this in public? And I have to say, I came to this project assuming there would be a lot more violence, like direct physical violence, and there was less than I thought. That's reassuring, I think. That isn't to say there aren't repercussions or minimize things, but I think I was happy to see that. This is probably one of the more outward acts. This was an act of arson, unfortunately, against one of the queens. Um, it was a the shed that they kept their drag uh, supplies in. It was burned down overnight. Um, this is another event here at the Safe Space in Cumberland, Maryland. Shout out to Safe Space that's here tonight. Um, and there was a big uh, protest online. People said they're going to come. They're going to protest the show. Maybe they're going to rough some people up. Uh, so this is one of our drag queens looking out the window. Just cop cars outside because nobody actually came. Um, and Christian Diane said, I think, very well that night. You know what? These people are cowards. <laughs> they like to make a lot of noise online and then never show up. But that simple act of threatening and never knowing that it might happen does damage anyway, right? So it's, you don't need to be physically violent to cause damage. But on this night, nobody showed up. We, we had a great night. You'll see some photos from this night in here. And then, of course, the everyday repercussions of friends or family members or community that doesn't understand you, uh, maybe outright rejects you. That, of course, has a long, uh, a long burn for a lot of people. And we explored those hard stories as well. And again, thank you so much for the trust and the vulnerability to share some of those. OK, second, I wanted to look at this um, kind of sense of being both seen and hidden in drag, right? Um, it, this is a very performative act. It's a very outward uh, kind of sexuality that's in, it's in the act. But at the same point in time, you're putting something on, right? You're hiding yourself in a way. We talked about this a lot in the interviews that we did. And I wanted to explore what it meant to be very seen at one, at one hand and also very hidden in the other. And what do you show and what do you not show? And what do those lights feel like? What is, it, what is it like to be a public figure and then not understood at the same time? Two photos that get after this. And I wanted, wanted to say while I'm on these photos, a lot of these photos you'll see tonight are actually really collaborative. Um, a lot of times what we would do would come out of the interviews that we'd have. But oftentimes when we do the shoot, we'd say, hey, I'd say to them, what, what do you want to do? <laughs> you know, you probably got better ideas than I do. Um, what, what do you want to do? And these are two shots that we both talked through and thought about and worked on together. So again, credit goes to the, the Queens as well for being a part of the artistic process. Um, another thing I wanted to look at, one of my favorite shots from the project, is kind of the two persona nature of drag. A lot of the Queens will have said at some point in time, you know, I've kind of got two personalities. And who you see on stage and who I am out of drag, they're not the same people. And for some folks, they're really far apart, those two personalities. Others, they're just barely far apart. You know, it's almost the same uh, on stage and off stage. But this kind of two persona thing really interested me. And so I wanted to make photos that were, there's a lot of photos in this project that are halfway in between. 
halfway in and out of drag. And I wanted to show that because we don't get to see that very often as the audience member. So this is one of those photos, but I love this one because it's a happy circumstance. Uh, French Silk, who's here tonight, good to see you. Um, and I were in Frostburg, Maryland, in, one, in a building looking for a place to shoot. And honest to God, we found this. This is not a created scene. It's a hunting uh, setup for archery practice, which is cool because I wanted to do the Appalachian country thing. But these little rainbow unicorns were there. We didn't place them. So we just, we, we just loved this. Um, I wanted to show the normalcy of queer identities. You know, there's the drag, and maybe that stands out, and there's sparkle and glitter. But then folks take off their drag uniforms, and they go do everyday shit that the rest of us do, like going. But I already had somebody tell me tonight they know exactly where this is. I bet a few people in the room do. This is a wonderful swimming hole uh, just outside of Cumberland, Maryland, in, in Town Creek. Uh, people go swimming. They like to drink beers. They like to hang out. Um, go to work, of course, we all, like, drag in this region is not going to pay for itself. People got to have other jobs, you know. We go to work, we do things. Um, this is a, a cleaning business that one of the queens has with their parent. Going shopping, this is at Goodwill. This photo, unfortunately, didn't make it in any of the publications, but I love it because it's the sniff test. And anyone <laughs> that has ever shopped at Goodwill knows about the sniff test. <laughs> and then finally, just a few uh, last photos here. Just kind of the wonderful, low-gloss nature of country drag. When you go and you see urban drag, um, I think it was Mary Jane that said this, you know, you see urban drag and everyone's got all this fancy stuff and we go there and they kind of snicker at us and look down at us. But what we have, we scrape together to make ourselves. It's totally authentic. It's totally who we are. And I think, to, honestly, to me, it's way more interesting and it's beautiful. So this kind of country drag, here's, um, again, right here in downtown Cumberland. This is that night at Safe Space, some backyard drag with some, some glitter and bubbles, some good photos out of that. Uh, this is at 1812 Brewery here in Cumberland, some um, farm drag. I love some farm drag. Um, <laughs> and this is here at Mezzo's Bar just down the street. And I love this one because we've got a queen here in the front, and we have the history of the queen city in the background. And Christian Dan, you're, you're getting quoted a few times tonight, but said to me that night, you know, the, the, the city's a bit like me, you know, a little old, a little wore down, a little rough around the edges, but still damn fine. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> you're right, you are damn fine. So anyway, love this photo. And last, uh, again, I want to come back to just giving an enormous shout out to both my assistants, uh, collaborators, co-creators, friends on this project. Y'all, there's so many photos like this. I'm going to share them back to you guys behind the scenes, helping make these photos. Ray Geringer, again, who um, recorded, was here for a week and wrote the story. Again, we could not have done it uh, without you. It is, again, about you, but it's also for you, and it's by you. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. OK, that's the end of my talk. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to do a time check here to see whether we should just roll into panel or we have time for questions. But before doing that, I want to make one final announcement. Um, if you didn't already see it, but the photo wall, all the little prints, um, those are just $15 each. We wanted to make them really affordable. So if you see something you like, um, you can buy it. You can pick it up at the end of the show. But all of the money that comes from the sale of that, I'm donating back uh, to the Queens to hopefully buy something like a collectively owned PA system. So anything you buy from there will go right back um, into the pot to support the community. So, all right, thank you. OK. OK. Well, why, why don't we do this? Um, so we're going to have a panel where we can explore some of the, the broader issues that, are, um, that underlie this project. But Awesome. Cool. Um, why don't I, I'm happy to take one or two if there's something that uh, pertains to me or my part of the story or making this project. I'm happy to speak to it if anybody has questions. Yes. Oh my gosh, biggest disappointment. That's a great question. That's a really great question. What's the biggest disappointment in, in making a project like this? I, I think when you... Um, when you work on a story like this, right? I think part of my job beyond building relationships, building connections, the second most important part of the work that I do is take something that's invisible and try to make it visible and understandable, right? You're trying to make something, ultimately there's the photos, hope the photos look pretty, but they're a gateway to get to understand something much deeper that's inside of somebody, right? For me, that's just the window that opens up to some deeper kind of understanding that we have um, via seeing, seeing the photos. I think anything for me that's a disappointment is just that, um, feeling like the work that I make doesn't really lead somebody to that, to that recognition, right? It's feeling like it's a limited vehicle for understanding. But within that, and this is why I'm encouraging again to go and read the words of the queens themselves, because to me that part is so important. I suppose my hope as a photographer is people see the photos, that's the foot in the door, but then, then they take the next step. And the next step for me is reading these articles, hearing the oral histories. And the next step beyond that is going to a show. And the next step beyond that is getting to know people, talking to them. You know, 
really trying to understand it for yourself. So again, if I have any disappointment, it's maybe that I feel sometimes my work is just entertainment, you know, but I hope it's more than that, right? I really hope it's more than that. Yeah. That was a great question. Awesome. Well, welcome. We're, we're glad to have you here. Does anybody want to, maybe this is a good time to dovetail into panel. If there's more questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. But I will hand over to the experts that can tell you how to find out more. Anybody want to take that one? Well, so far tonight, we're doing little uh, pop-up numbers between 6 and 8 out there. But August 19th, up at Dig Deep, did I say it the right one? We are doing a show up there. Deep end, deep end. Huh? Deep end. deep end. Well, I get them confused. And I've had a drink. You know, you know, I'm blonde. I'm drinking. I'm old. What can I say? But, you know, just check out with our face, Facebook with us. I'm Wade Bowers. There's other ones out here. Just become friends with us. Check our Facebook. We put shit out there all the time. And would you like to introduce our panel then? And okay, and introduce yourself, or or I can. Yeah. Just make this work, because we are working on a uh, time here. So I will start with an introduction of myself, where I will model answering the first question and then just pass it down the line. How's that? Um, so if you can introduce yourself, say what your relationship is to Cumberland, and then say when was the first time you were ever aware of someone in drag in this area, okay? So my name is Heidi Gardner, and I grew up queer and non-binary just down the road and across the river in Kaiser, but I was born in Cumberland. Um, so that is my relationship to Cumberland. And I was born in 1975, so um, when I was coming of age, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. I don't recall public drag because I was too young. Um, but I remember going to houses, my grandmother was a teacher, and we would go to teachers' houses, like for parties and barbecues, and there would sometimes be people there in drag. Um, they might have called it cross-dressing, but that was my first awareness of um, explicit queerness in the form of dressing or transgressing gender here in this area. And I'm gonna pass it. My name is Greg Malloy. I'm a native of Cumberland. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so my first experience with a drag queen would have been 1982 when I came out. And there was a black bar in Cumberland called uh, Cooper's. But on Monday night, they would have drag night. Uh, or, um, I'm sorry, gay night. And every once in a while, they would have a drag show on... on uh, gay night, and that would be my first exposure to drag queens. And then, of course, at, at house parties, you would, uh, especially Halloween parties, <laughs> you would have our share of dra drag queens there. I, and I remember uh, when E.T. was in drag, <laughs> and then that Halloween, there were a lot of drag queens that looked very similar to <laughs> E.T. <laughs> on that, that day. Anyway. That's all I have for now. We'll get back to it. I'm Mary Jane LaFay. Um, I'm a new native to Cumberland. I've been here about five years now. Um, my first experience with drag here was one of the first shows I went to in 2018, 2019. One of, one of them, too. Uh, right at Embassy with Christian Diane, Mona Lott. Um, and that, that was the first one, and I was hooked ever since, you know. I joined the family that night. Mona became my grandma, and I performed that night, and I haven't stopped since. So, thank you. Okay, you're probably going to have to call time on me because I do have a mouth that runs. I'm Christian Diane, a former Queen City Queen, Queen of Pride, yada, yada, yada. I came down here from Altoona to visit Cooper's back in the mid-1990s. First night met I met that night was Rhonda Joe. 
And we hit it off, and the next thing you know, we were, as I've joked, I did a show that I thought was a show that turned out to be a cattle call. Anybody and everybody showed up that night, but we eventually formed the original Queen City Queens with Rhonda Jo, Mona Lott, Eartha Kitt, and myself. But if it wouldn't have been for Rhonda Jo, a lot of this stuff wouldn't be happening still today. And I know she looks down fondly on all of us. I miss my sister. What can I say? Into the light. So, Mike, just given what, did you learn anything new just now? And uh, do you have any questions based on the answers to those questions? Yeah, well, I, again, I'll repeat. So my first experience was in uh, 2011. Uh, at the Queen of Queen City pageant here in the Embassy Theater. But as I, we've gone and done these interviews, particularly as we've spoken to um, elder members of the community, I realized that this wasn't something that was new when I saw it first. It had been here, but I think for a lot of us that were new to it, we didn't know it was here and didn't know where to look, right? And so it's sort of that, that hidden nature of it. And hopefully we're breaking down more of those barriers and more people are experiencing this and coming face to face with it. Because I think it's really hard to know or understand something that you don't see and experience, right? Sometimes somebody can be uh, forgiven, I, I hope maybe, for not understanding something they've never been around. So it was new to me in 2011, um, but, uh, but had been going on for, for quite a bit longer, of, of course. And I was um, happy to discover that in the course of, of doing this project. Um, I, I guess what I would come back and, and ask then is how you think the public perception has changed during that time? For the folks that have experienced this longer, what have you seen over the course of that period in terms of how people talk about it, what the, what the crowd is like, how that has changed? You know, my perception of a more diverse crowd than I thought how that's changed and how people have treated you and, and talked to you about this over the years. For anybody that wants it, I'll pass back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, I feel like it gets bigger every year. Each show, you know, Pride, the first year I did it was only like a few few hundred people, you know, and now we're 5,000 or more every year, you know. It just gets bigger and bigger, you know. Uh, each show, too, you know, we're all, we've gotten to where, like, we get regulars at the shows, you know, and we, we're doing more shows more often, like uh, we do a show about once a month now, you know, so you can look out about every month for a show at some point. Sure. For me, you know, it, it's, it's nice to witness back in the day, uh, talking the 80s, a lot of gays were even self-conscious to be seen with drag queens. It was a stigma within a stigma, you know, uh, and so to see the community being embraced by the mainstream community, it's been a joy to witness. Yeah. That makes me think of how we can, um, I don't want to say educate, that sounds pedantic, but what can we let people know sort of about the community that we feel safe saying, but that also is sort of... Um, Enlightening. So I guess we do have we have one house, and I don't know if I don't know how many of you are familiar with like the house culture. Mary Jane, would you address the House of Lafay or tell people about that? So the House of Lafay is uh, a house me and my drag sister started when we first started drag like four years ago, and it was just to help all us baby queens, you know, get together and you know work on drag, work on learning and just grow and do more and have more shows, you know. The the rest of the queens were a little little older than us. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so, you know, we had a little more energy and wanted to do a little more shows than they did. So we formed our own house and, uh, you know, took, you know, kind of took over the reins and started doing more shows, more events, as much as we could. Well, not really, because I never really belonged to a house. I've been the like the Annie of the group, little orphan Annie, never had a drag mother. Didn't really, I was put down when I first started because I found out later from one of the older queens, they thought I had something and they were scared about me if I ever got my shit together. Uh, back in the day of the 80s, once you hit like 40 and they knew it, the bars, bye. You're too old, we want the young pretty ones. Well, I turned 65 this year. I've done drag for 40 years. 
and I'm not ashamed to admit to any of it, but I did live through the 80s where I lost many, many friends, family, and, you know, people that were like sisters to me due to the AIDS epi epidemic. And it just seemed like at one point all we were doing, as we used to jokingly call them, was the death benefit. Because people would die and they had no money and their family didn't give a you-know-what about them. So we at least tried to raise enough to do a cremation and give a proper send-off to them. And it broke my heart when I found out that down in Daytona Beach, there was this older queen named Billy Boots. She was basically the mother of drag of Daytona. She laid in the morgue for a month till they had raised enough money to take care of it. That somebody that was that big of an icon and nobody would step forward and say, here's the thousand, here's two thousand dollars for all the work she's done, all the stuff people we have done to raise money more for other people and other charities. But, you know, nowadays things are a little bit more understanding. There's GoFundMe, there's other things. And I do believe that each and every year it's become bigger, more popular here in Cumberland. And for this being Trump territory, we are very well accepted here by people. You know, it's amazing. You know, there's a few people that don't like us. I have a neighbor like that, but you know what? Screw them. But anyway, I'm going to hand the bag, mic back because, again, I say I do have a mouth that runs. It's okay. We like, we like hearing. Um, so that does bring us to an interesting thing that, that we can say about um, the queer community in general, which is I, I didn't anticipate at 48 years old almost that I would be considered an elder in a community. Um, <laughs> but we, we do have... We, we do have loss. We do have an entire generation where I don't have as many people to look to, so I'm super grateful for the people who are my age and older who are willing to tell stories, and that's why we're working so hard to form a strong community that interacts with you all so that you can tell the stories of the people you knew, even if you're not a member of the queer community. We need you to tell the stories of the people that you knew, and now I'm preaching, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the mic to Greg, and Greg, can you, can you tell us about um, your perception of the queer community in general and what that was like and what you see now in terms of um, changing here in Cumberland, but also just in the wider world. Well, I'll try to do it without crying because I'm just so filled with joy. <laughs> <laughs> the gay community back in the day was something to be scared of. And it's so nice to witness and to be a part of embracing being gay. So, <laughs> that's all I can do. He's not gonna make it, friends. He has, he, has so, he has so much to tell us, but he's overwhelmed. But I think that that, that tells you, that's how it then gets handed oh, yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'll mention just a little bit, uh, I'm so grateful that we do have house representation here. Um, they, they are, again, it's strange. They feel like they're mothers of houses and some of their elders are in their house. But in, in queer culture, it started with the black and Latina communities, um, especially in the larger cities, but in New York City and the ball culture is where the houses grew out of. And it was families being created for people who did not have families. Um, and so do any of you want to speak to the concept of family in the queer community? Well, for a lot of it, it's just that exact word, family, you know. That my drag sister is my sister, you know. And um, they become your family, you know. They become everything to you, you know. And it's quick and it's strong, you know. Um, I, and a lot of gay people tell you, you know, drag saved their life or their drag family saved their life, you know. You feel like you're going at it alone for so long. And then, you know, you find people that are just like you, you know, going through the same thing and, you know. You become close, you become family, you know, and it's just how it be. You know, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> I'm sorry we made a joke about this. We were going to make a smoking game out of that. 
But anyway, we do want to give a shout out to Radio LaFay sitting there. Since I don't know if any of us have done it yet tonight. And her other half, and I can't, I know I'm going to screw it up. I want to say Ben Eden. <laughs> I know that's not it. <laughs> huh? Oh, I got it right? Close, close enough, okay. But I want to thank them. They were a little late getting here, you know. Some of us, we're on drag time, which means anywhere from a half hour to an hour late, just so you all know for the future reference. Some of us run late. Some of them do run late. So I'm, this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug, though, for them. Um, one of the things that, so I, again, I, I sort of always had uh, queer friends and cousins, like, living like Harry Potter under the stairs in my basement. I, I was a drag mother, strangely enough, without being a drag queen from the time I was, like, 18 years old. And um, But one of the things, uh, it was... I'm here tonight partially, I mean, because Mike asked me, but also um, I coordinate volunteers for the Cumberland Pride Festival. So next year when I send out that application, you all can volunteer for the Cumberland Pride Festival. But volunteering for the Cumberland Pride Festival um, involves the queens. And the queens are volunteers. They work for their tips. And it's because it's such an important part of the celebration and things like that. But I do want to give a plug for their shows. Um, this year... Uh, I have a theater background, so our, my inner drag queen, if I have one, does definitely conflict with my theatrical uh, on-time persona. I'm very much like, I'm very much like, you know, stage manager, call five, we're going, right? Um, and so I have learned a lot by like being flexible, and they have learned a lot by I will start without you. Um, <laughs> but it's, that's for everyone's sake, right? We're just, we're trying, we're trying, but they do, they have a show August 19th. We're doing a back to school show. There will be no children involved. So when all the hullabaloo on the Facebook starts about like, why are the Queens doing a back to school show? Just ignore it and please come support it August 19th. These are shows that we've had the privilege of doing, um, at the deep end. Uh, we have another one. Well, actually then the Queen of Queen City pageant is coming back. Uh, at the embassy at the end of September. And uh, it's funny, if you were at the Queen of Queen City pageant that year, Mike, I was also in the building. Um, when I came back, when I moved back here, I moved back because I was determined to be like, this is who you made me to the community that raised me, right? Um, anyway, so that is so that is happening. The Queen of Queen City pageant is coming back. Uh, the last weekend in October, we're doing a spooky show because... Again, Halloween is the gateway drug for all of drag everywhere, right? I can guarantee you almost every drag queen started at Halloween in some way or another. And then we're doing a bling in the new year. Um, and I do all of the, like, right now I'm doing, like, a lot of production because we just want shows to happen and we want to be able to say this is when the next show's happening. And they do all the creative work. Um, and... I wanted to know if you all wanted to talk about your experiences at the local shows this year. What ha What's felt different? Or just the fact that they're happening? <laughs> well, the fact that they're happening is a little different. <laughs> we used to do ones like one every three months, and you know, now we're literally every month, if not more than one a month, you know. And it feels different because of you know, people are hearing about them more. We're getting bigger crowds and more support, you know, and we honestly, I can't complain. The turnouts for the shows this year have been amazing, you know. The turnout for Pride lately, amazing, you know. The, it shows that the community is here to support us, you know. They will show up for us, you know. They do love us. So, you know, it's amazing, and I love it, you know. And I'll do them all, all the shows you want. <laughs> well, I haven't been in the last couple shows, and God knows I've caught hell for that from people out there, but, you know, I am it to show up at Dig Deep. Deep End. Deep End. I'm sorry. I still remember what was it used to be called? Dante's, yes. Yes, I got in up there when it was Dante's, but, you know, show up, we'll have fun. We do a variety of music. I understand there may be a tribute to Sinead O'Connor planned. 
might be a country number. You never know what I could pull out or one of the rest of us. But, you know, show up, have fun, support us. Tip us if you like us. If you don't have the money, you know what? Just show up and still have fun. Before I forget, I want to ask, especially the queens, what advice do you have? There, there. I mean, you can start drag anytime, right? But you might also know someone who wants to start drag. What, what's your advice, especially in this area, um, to becoming part of the drag community? Um, nothing really. Message one of the queens. You know, they'll literally be like, "You want in the next show?" You know, the drag community so open, even for me, my first show and. You know, they was like, you're in the next one, right? You know, and we'll probably do the same thing. You show up to a show and you say you got interest, we'll be like, you in the next one? And that's pretty much how it works. Just remember, it does cost a lot of money to dress this cheap, as Dolly would tell us all. Well, we all love Dolly. You know, you cannot help but love Dolly because a lot of other shit happens in a small town, is all I can say. I had to slip that one in there. I know I screwed it up, but you know, I've been drinking. Yeah, no. <laughs> but we're here to have fun. We like to, you know, have a good time. But if people want help, we will help as much as we can. But remember, you need to eventually buy your own clothing, your own makeup, your own hair, because we have a lot invested in this stuff. So, you know, just just don't forget. But you can also go to Goodwill, like a good friend of mine and I do, and we find all kinds of fabulous little outfits for a dollar or maybe five dollars if we're splurging that day. But, you know, go out there and have fun, and if people don't like the way you look, well, fuck them. Here we are, everybody. Mike, do you have, uh, again, I, I just, I, I really so much value um, your uh, dedication, I think, especially like the, I know that the drag artists have just been so excited about the project behind the scenes. And I mean, they express it to you, but they also express it literally at every show, at every conversation. It has been very inspiring. I think it has uh, it has fueled a lot, and I think that we are grateful as a community to represent what drag is in rural Appalachian, um, Maryland. And I want to know if you uh, can can say something about that and how that affects you. Like I know that you are have been an observer, um, but in your observations, do you then have again more questions? Uh, it's, it's been a dialogue all along, and I want it to still be one. Yeah. <laughs> it is right on the verge, so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, wait, can you rephrase the question for me one more time? What, what, what is it you want me to speak to? Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, I think for, for me, in, in my short time being involved with this, so I'm just a, I'm just a decade in, um, but I think it's been really exciting to see the, the Pride Festival here grow. You know, this, the, 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 the drag scene has generally continued to expand with some fluctuations here and there over the year, but the emergence of the Pride Festival is really exciting. And I've heard recently, I think it's the largest in the region now. I don't know what that, where they're drawing that to create that definition. But we've watched it go from a few hundred, few, a thousand people in the first year to, what was, do you, do you guys know what the number was? Does anyone know what the number was? It was some astronomical. Yeah. And, and for me, I think to come back to the question that was asked before about sort of my disappointment, but, al but also my hope for this work, is that the work is an avenue to, to dig deeper, to learn more, to get more involved, to break down the stigmas we have inside of ourselves, or to maybe ask questions we didn't know we even had, but to, you know, 
make friends with this community and get to understand get to understand them in, in their own words. But in much the same way, I, I feel similarly about drag, right? Drag is kind of the forward most leading edge, maybe the most visible edge in some ways of the queer community. And I think what, what I hope that it does is just sort of opens that door that folks can take the next step. Maybe you know, go, go to the Pride Festival or maybe take the time to get to know somebody down the street to really, you know, dig in deeper, essentially. And so I think you guys do similar work to the photos in the sense that you kind of lead that edge, start those conversations, and then hopefully it trickles out over time. And so when I see something like the Pride Festival growing, it's hard to know what causes that, like what's underneath of that. It's probably a lot of different things, but I certainly think that the drag community is part of that, right? And has been a part of that in a, in a lot of different ways by helping to make, again, what's invisible visible and uh, to sort of normalize this in, in the community. So again, that's my hope for the photos, and I think that drag does something similar. I think what, what, what I would like to say is I'd be really curious to hear if the audience has any questions, kind of based on where the conversation has gone so far and the talk earlier. We'd love to hear from y'all as well, if it's a good time to, to do that. Yes. I'm actually just going to, is it okay if I bring the microphone? I don't think we have a second one. You're just going to, you're just going to scream really loud, Vic? I can say yes, probably not locally, but we also have some that are polyamorous, bisexual. I mean, there's all kinds of different headings a lot of them come under. I'm old school, you know, but I do have known some over the years that were straight, that they had a wife, they had kids, they just enjoyed doing a show. We also have our local... Abfab, is that the correct term? That, you know, she was born female at birth, but she does drag. And she does a wonderful job, you know? And I'm one of those few of the older ones that I don't mind any of that, you know? As long as they're out there having fun and the audience is entertained, I don't care if they're bait, great, yeah. Gay, straight, bisexual, you know, whatever they want to call under. As long as they're having fun and they're entertaining the people, that's all that matters. I think drag has redefined uh, itself a lot in the last few years, especially in relationship to um, the community's self-definitions and self-evolution. And so it's a tricky question to say straight, gay, because there are so many people um, who are not conforming to what we understood as um, cisgender, which just means not transgender, um, heteronormative lifestyles. Um, I'm a non-binary person, but I still present in a way that is very feminine. So so there, so it's, it's actually harder to answer that question now because so many people fall under the umbrella um, of queer. Uh, Aradia, you do have a question? Okay. Mike, my question is, I mean, and you don't have to lie just because they're sitting beside you. Um, out of your whole time doing this, what is your favorite performance and why? And what is your least favorite performance? And I want Queen's names. <laughs> no one's making it easy for me, are you? Um, okay, so there. I, I to, to go back to 2011. There's something really, really special about this night. And again, it's that whenever folks come out on the stage, literally nothing worked. Like the fog machine fell on the stage and broke, and fog was shooting out everywhere. All the numbers were off. People would come off and sort of wailing their hands around somewhere. I think somebody tried to do a death drop. You know, that's the thing. I can go about this wide. But where they drop on the floor and <laughs> came up and sort of hobbled off the stage, broken. <laughs> but Nobody missed a beat, and everyone was having fun. You know, and, and that, to me, despite the fact that it's not always glamorous, it doesn't always work, uh, that, to me, is such a high watermark, right? Because it's, again, the, the drag is just a surface-level thing. The, the community and what we're there for is something much, much bigger. So that night lives to me in a, in like in a, in a very, um, very special place in my heart. This is at, at the Embassy Theater, yeah. So I think that was a, that was a high watermark. Oh my gosh, what was the worst? You're going to make me answer that question? That's awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 
I, I uh, well, I, I can tell you what what it would have been is that they had threatened to put me in drag this past <laughs> this past Pride Festival, and luckily I was on the other side of the country, and they weren't able to do that. But had they have been able to, I can guarantee that would have been the worst drag that has come to this area in a long time. And that's the best answer you're gonna get. It's a naughty question. <laughs> yeah. Um. More questions. Yeah. Dad. That's a great question. Yeah, you know, I was saying I was saying before about courage and support and community. Maybe you can speak to that, what that's meant for you and where you find that, where you find community. Okay, I'll grab it first, then you can grab it second, you know. <laughs> it's going to become a running joke. Uh, back in 1999, I lost both of my parents months apart. Well, in the process of all this, I lost my siblings. They wanted nothing due to me. Well, I found out the one was because I was openly gay, and he was a deacon at his local church, even though he cheated on his wife numerous times. You know how the good Christians are. But as a result of everything, I hadn't had what I considered family in a long time. But I do have family now. And one of them is sitting right out there with their, sitting there, yeah, cross the legs, girl, don't be doing the Sharon Stone thing. But, you know, we go to Goodwill when we can and have fun. And her, they, they, yeah, i got to get these pronouns correct. Their other half has welcomed me into the whole little family with the three kids and everything. I was actually disappointed not to see him tonight. But, you know, God, there I am. You're worried, oh, turning into me. But we make our own family. We have the family we were born with, and then we're the family we make. And I got a lot of people out there tonight that are part of my family, and I thank each and every one of you. I love you all. I feel like it's different for every performer or queer person in our community. You know, I'm actually very close with my blood family and I'm very close with my drag family. You know, my drag family comes to my family holidays, Thanksgiving, all that, you know, and is accepted as family too. You know, my family call my drag sister, my sister. They ask about her just as much as they do my life, you know, so it's. It's all different, you know. It's different for everybody, you know. Family can be blood or not, but this community here in Cumberland is one big family, you know. We're all very close. And I think that, again, the perception is because media and whatever tells you that the gay experience is one thing or whatever. But in fact, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of people, even through history, who had supportive families. Um, I don't know, Greg, do you want to speak about the difference or like what your relationship is to your queer family or your any kind of family? <laughs> well, I, I'm one of the lucky gays that came out to their family and I was born and raised Catholic, and they all, all seven, br six brothers uh, embraced me. Yeah, my parents embraced me. It was, it was wonderful. It was, it was true love. Uh, and then I'm grateful that that happened to me because I've witnessed it the other way and other kids, like you were saying, you know, uh, people rejecting them because of religion or, or something and, and just, uh, and a, uh, during the early 80s, I remember going to one funeral where there was one family member and me at this funeral. Mm. And it was heart-wrenching. So it's nice to see all these chosen families and regular, you know, the, the biological families and the uh, chosen families getting together and, and loving. You know, it's all about the love. And it's so nice to witness all this love. Yeah, Redneck Cumberland, <laughs> I, I, I have to say this, Redneck Cumberland, there were 400 people at our wedding. <laughs> so, yeah, times are changing. 
You can have it all. Be gay, do drag, join our family. One more question. I think we're getting to a place. Yeah, it's 5.57. We're about to um, transition into, I think people are going to start coming in. But if there, if there is another burning question, we can take one more. Or is everybody, oh, Claire, yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, what a great question to wrap up on. Um, yeah, I think for, for me, the privilege of doing this work, I mean, I, I feel it every time I'm with you guys, every time I'm there, to be invited in and get to experience, even just as a, still a voyeur, but, but much closer to your world, that to me feels like the most precious part of this. And as this comes to a close, this chapter comes to a close, it's always really hard for me to, to let go. I think I remember telling y'all when we started taking photos back in 2017, he's like, oh, I'm sure I'll be wrapped up in 2019. And then it's 2020. And then it's 21 and 22 and 23. And I could keep doing this, honestly. Like, I, I, I've loved every minute of working on this project. This project is one that's probably maybe the closest to my heart, if not one of the very few that I've worked on in the last 12 years of doing this, 15 years almost. So it's very, very hard to say goodbye to it. But, but this is a turning point in the project, too. I think I've learned with my work that there comes a, comes a time when it's time to button it up and kind of move it out to the next phase. And, and the phase that it's in right now is this, right? It's really taking the work and making the work do work, helping it to support all the amazing stuff that's already there, right? And again, when you go looking, there are so many people in any community that are pushing these dialogues, building safe spaces, building festivals, putting on shows, you know, making more spaces for more people to feel included. So for me, I just feel so honored to be a small part of that and hopefully a useful part of that. But, but this project is probably buttoning up. But there will be more in the future. Um, this is an issue that, that means a lot to me. And again, I think, again, where I see people finding the courage to build broader circles and maybe take, to take that on themselves and take the risk on themselves to do that, I get inspired. And when I'm inspired, I want to work. So I know I'll be back. Uh, I know I'll be doing more. But this is also a, um, tonight really is an ending point for me, too. I, I grew up in Appalachia, and I've been living near here for the last 10 years, and now I'm going to be several hundred miles more away, which is not too far that I won't come back and say hi, but um, a project this becomes very hard to do unless you can show up on the fly. Um, and it's been awesome to be able to show up on the fly and be with you all the last 10 years. So I just want to say thanks again. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll send everyone out, but I've got a few um, final announcements. Um, to kind of waypoint you on, again, first, I do really encourage you to read the essay. Again, that's where you'll hear the words. You'll hear the stories. You'll see more photos. Again, the QR codes can do that, and you can also purchase it. Excitingly, this project's actually been seen all over the world now. Um, it's the winner of the Zeke Award for Documentary Photography. It was in New York City um, at a show in Photoville where it was seen by millions of people outdoors. It's in Boston right now. It was in a gallery in Barcelona. We've been in Spain with this show. Yeah. I was a winner of an award from Photo Nostrum a number of years ago. Um, it was a finalist in the International Portrait Awards from Lens Culture, which is an international award um, seen by millions of people there. And I can't give exact names because we haven't inked to this yet, but a, a top magazine in one of the largest uh, countries in Europe, <laughs> I will say, uh, is planning on doing another full story on this very soon. Um, so there'll be a massive audience that's going to see this uh, more. And it's a bunch of national and international outlets in the US that are looking at this content. So in terms of the content generation, maybe that part is over. But this expanding the, the community of, um, of conversation is, is really just beginning. So I'm, I'm really, really excited for that. And finally, to go back to the question was answered here, where can you find out more? It can be tricky sometimes to find out when the next show is. I would suggest following Cumberland Pride on Instagram, um, following the local uh, Mezzos or Allegheny Arts Council on Instagram, Facebook, finding out the names of the folks tonight, following their Facebook and Instagram pages, because they'll usually be sharing where the shows are. So if you want to get to know people more, if you want to find out what's up, that's what I did over the past couple of years, is I just got to know people, followed them on social media, and figured out what's happening. So if you like what you saw tonight, I really encourage you to do that. And thank you again so much for being here. And thank you so much for the Queens um, for being here tonight, and for Heidi as well, for being a wonderful moderator. And thank you so much as well. Yeah. And thank you guys, and have a great night.